Hello, this is Angelique, and you're listening to We're Booked Up, a segment of the Gaston Speaks podcast wherein Kendall, Andrew, and I discuss books. For this episode, we'll be discussing How Can I Help You by Laura Sims, a psychological sus- suspense novel largely set in a public library. There will be spoilers. But first, what have we, we been reading or watching? Well, I read this, and I finished it about four and a half minutes ago. <laughs> Kendall saw me <laughs> finishing it. Very impressed. Um, I haven't been watching I, I, I'm trying to catch up on, so I'm a member of um, something called Film Independent, and I finally got my screeners for all my little indie spirit things. So there have been some cool ones. I watched one called Theater Camp, which was hilarious and ridiculous and funny. It's actually on Amazon Prime, so if you guys want to watch that. And then um, I recently watched The Holdovers, which is the new Alexander Payne film that um, won two Golden Globes this past weekend. And I absolutely adored it. I thought it was absolutely fantastic. And the woman who won, Davon Joy Randolph, which when you listen to our Oscar podcast coming up soon, um, she uh, knocked it out of the um, park. So that was, and I, I love Paul Giamatti. So that that's, I would recommend that. Um, we're getting it soon here at the library. So hopefully you'll be able to watch it soon. Um, and it's on Peacock. So if you have Peacock, you can watch it there. Kendall? You go next because I'm really trying to remember what we were watching. <laughs> oh, um. So I read uh, We Have Always Lived in the Castle, which, you know, because it was mentioned in the book. And then... Oh, the Shirley Jackson? Yeah. Oh, okay. Was it good? Yeah, I liked it. Okay. And I kind of want to see the movie now, but... I'm they not... made There's a movie? a movie? They made a movie. It's 2018. Yeah, 2018 starring... Um, I don't know who plays Mary Cat, but Alexandra Daddario is Constance. And then um, Sebastian Stan... Is no kidding. Charles, yeah. And then the uncle is, um, Uncle Julian is played by the guy from Game of Thrones who is the brother. Um, uh, Nicholas yeah, Coster yeah, Waddell. Yeah. 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 Uh, How did I miss this movie? I don't know. Maybe it wasn't good, but I'm going to watch it anyway. <laughs> it's got good people in it. No, we have always, yeah. It, yeah. it apparently is not good. <laughs> no, it, it, got, it got decent reviews. Yeah. Okay. So I might like it. I like the book. Um, and then. T- Tessa Farmiga, Tessa Farmiga, Vera Farmiga's oh. you know, sister who was in American Horror Story. She plays uh, Mary Cat. Cool. Okay. It, Crispin Glover <laughs> plays Uncle Julian. Okay. Not Nicholas Because it looked Keller. like, oh, it was a very small picture because it kind of looked like him. Gotcha. But that makes sense too. He ple- he'd be good at that. Okay. Crispin Glover. Wow. Um. <laughs> You're intrigued by this, aren't you? <laughs> yes. I'm going to. Are I'm, you going to watch the movie and then I'm read the book? S- probably seek it out. Yes, because I have to watch movies before I read the books. Oh, gotcha. Um, and then what did I watch? Oh, my brother and I are rewatching an old anime that we liked several years ago called uh, Yu Yu Hakusho. Mm-hmm. It's very old. It was uh, from 1992 because a, a, a live action came out on Netflix hmm. that, was, that we liked. So, well, that's it. That's all I've done. Have you remembered what you watched? No, it's something that I feel like I can remember being like, I should say that I watched this. I'll just tell you what why it's been watching a okay. lot. He's um fallen into Dragon Ball Z mm-hmm. and um Marcus is not caught up with Dragon Ball Z, so they're like watching it together, but then Wyatt is like gung ho. And so he is also now watching Naruto. And as a result, my very picky eater is eating ramen. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. I like that that Culture can influence <laughs> dietary habits. Because Lord knows I can't. <laughs> yeah. Maybe find find something watch. with like broccoli in it and see if he likes he it. Does like he? Oh, he likes broccoli. broccoli. Okay. Like, and and he has no shame about it. He's like, it's yeah, I like broccoli, but okay. I can't get him to like. I don't know. He's in a weird texture food place. I don't know. It doesn't matter. For a while, my nephew would only eat like cucumbers and mac and cheese. Yeah. And that's like brilliant. dino nuggets. That, that was it. So there was at least. Some carbs, some protein, some you know, it was a There's mixture. A little bit of fiber, but, yeah, yeah, but not a lot. So that's okay. They're little. They're growing. They're fine. Yeah, they're fine. No one. Anyway, I, maybe I'll remember what I was watching in the middle of one of you talking later, and I'll interrupt you briefly. <laughs> 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 All right, we ready to talk about the book? Mm-hmm. All right, I I'm will... very, very ready because right, it's then. fresh. <laughs> 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 Before I forget it, because that could happen. All yeah. right. Let's start with the synopsis. I was going to say I finished it like two days ago and now I'm already like, do I remember everything? I don't think I do. All right. uh, The lives of two librarians become dangerously intertwined in this razor sharp exploration of human nature and the lure of artistic obsession. No one knows Margot's real name. 
Her colleagues and patrons at a small-town public library know only her middle-aged normalcy, congeniality, and charm. They have no reason to suspect that she is, in fact, a former nurse with a trail of premature deaths in her wake. She has turned a new page, so to speak, and the library is her sanctuary, a place to quell old or- old urges. That is, at least, until Patricia, a recent graduate and failed novelist, joins the library staff. Patricia quickly notices Margot's subtly sinister edge and watches her carefully. When a tragic incident in the library bathroom gives her a hint of Margot's mysterious past, Patricia can't resist digging deeper, even as her new fixation becomes all-consuming and sends both women hurtling toward disaster. Chilling, incisive, and darkly humorous, How Can I Help You is a propulsive work of psychological suspense that asks how far we might go to justify our monstrous desires. All right, what do we think of that? That was very well written, the synopsis. Um, <laughs> it, 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 it sold it. <laughs> I will say I don't think it was a razor's edge. No. I don't think it was that tense. Like on the back of the book, it's like a deadly deadly web of intrigue, high stakes game of cat and mouse. I don't mm. think that's the case. No. no. But um, I do think it was like eerie. It was psychological. That is also on the back of the book and accurate. I also did not find it darkly funny. And I'll, and I'll get into why but um yeah because I, I mean even the front the, a dark and spellbinding descent into jolly madness and i'm I'm not a big reader but I'm a, I'm a huge film buff anyway i'm getting into it i'll get into it later never mind okay but i didn't think it was that darkly funny either okay so yeah i did because of our experiences working in the library <laughs> that was the most relatable part was the library part because that that really was funny that we, that, that worked are we ready to rate okay, it yeah do no do him first i'm gonna go like two. Um, again, I loved the library part, like because either this person did a lot of research or was a librarian. Do we know? Yes, yes. we do. Part time reference librarian. Okay, perfect. So she knows. And and like the joke about um, you know, when Patricia is like, um, I want to go back to the more academic stuff of, of grad school and I'm like, Yeah, honey, I know. <laughs> <laughs> what a waste of nine thousand dollars in two years. But anyway, and so um <laughs> Probably more for her. <laughs> Probably a lot more than yeah. she said. There was like $15,000 in yeah. debt or something mm-hmm. like that. Um, and so that part I related to. I think that there was a lot of setup that could have worked. I think that her writing style was not bad. Like she's she she just very descriptive. I just – I felt like um, – I felt like it wasn't razor enough. It wasn't funny enough. It wasn't psychological enough. It kind of – eh. Mm-hmm. It, it wasn't as thrilling as it purported to be. Mm-hmm. So it's not the worst thing ever, two, two and a half maybe, but it, it kind of by the end. So, Yeah, this is a four-star book for me. <laughs> I liked it. Oh, really? So uh-huh. I will agree that it was not the, like, it didn't live up to the description. I feel like it was a mis, uh, what do you call it, misadvertisement. Like, I think they advertised the wrong book. False advertisement? Yeah. Like, they were trying to get you to come in and read another book. This book, mm-hmm. for me, it's. The reason I liked Gone Girl is why I liked this book. I didn't particularly enjoy any of the characters. I kind of hated them all. Mm-hmm. And I loved being in that world where you just – you don't necessarily have to like a character to – or, like, find them to be virtuous or the best in order to enjoy getting in their mind and poking around. I also around. did not like – Gone Girl. So. See, I did. I loved Gone Girl. It made me so mad. Even the movie was David Fincher. You know, I thought, mm-hmm. oh, I'm going to love this. So it was fine. It was well made. It was really long. Anyway. Um, That's funny because I was like, I bet he might like this if it were a movie, maybe. But I didn't think he would like it. But yeah, I know I definitely like no, it. No, and I'll tell you, because I'm going to use movie examples that I felt like would be comparable that I liked a lot better mm-hmm. and why I didn't feel like it hit the mark on any of those. So this is this is my when I go into my rant later. I'm sorry, Angelique. Cool, mm-hmm. cool, mm-hmm. cool, cool. I don't know. I can also believe that there are better – like I can believe that the Shirley Jackson oh, yeah, castle – What is it? What is we the have title? always lived in the castle. Yeah, I can totally believe that's better. And I kind of wanted to ask you yesterday when I saw that you were reading it, I'm like, did you like linger when you went to go pull it off the shelf? Did you like put your finger on the spine? <laughs> no, because I'm not creepy like that. <laughs> uh, what was your rating? rating um, probably like 2.75 to 3 maybe. Well, I didn't hate it, but it yeah. took me a while to get into it. So I'm the little yeah. score? That yeah. never happens. It does it? Yes, it I, does. Yeah, it does. Oh. I think it happens more than not. <laughs> uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like I'm either like 
way lower or I'm way higher than everybody. I feel like I'm not. There's no you live in between. In the <laughs> yeah, I do. I do in so many ways. Anyway, go yeah. for it. it's a two point seven five. I just focused on some things that probably shouldn't have been focused on because they're not important, but they just stuck with me. So, and they're, I'll get to them. I'm Enjoy. good with that. I, yeah. I will appreciate yeah. all the feedback, and I will also still enjoy the book. Yeah, that's what happened last time. Which is good. Where you still hated the book. <laughs> I, did. I didn't like it. I didn't like it. Yeah. As much. Well, I didn't hate it. It just wasn't as good. The characters... It could, it just you made me like better. it a lot less, I will say. <laughs> See, I don't want to do that. <laughs> I didn't didn't my, it wasn't my like mind. my favorite book either. Like, yeah, so it was fine. All right. So we ready for the questions? Yeah. Yeah. All right, first question. What did you think of Margot and Patricia? I, I, I didn't think either of them were as interesting as they wanted us to believe they were. Okay. I just didn't. I, I, they're kind of sad people. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> the one's a sociopath. Woohoo. Like, it, she's not even particularly that sociopathic. She's like, you know, putting dying sick people out of their misery. It's not like, you know, I mean, mm, whatever. Aren't you a little sociopathic <laughs> now? No, I just. I, it, I don't know. I didn't find either of them that interesting. I just didn't. And it, then it became like, oh, well, Patricia is supposed to be bad because, spoiler r- reminder, there's spoiler alerts, because she's writing this book. And when she figures out who she is, she's she knows she should tell someone, but she wants to finish her book. I'm like, okay, whatever. Like, I didn't feel like that was that dark of a twist. And maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I, because th- it was like, she didn't actually wasn't complicit in anything. I mean, yeah, at the end, I guess Patricia had her, her dark moment. But you know what? She deserved to die. So it was like... <laughs> I don't know. I just didn't particularly like either of them because I felt like they both could have been sharper. They could have been – there could have been more interaction that was more socio- like psychological between the two of them. I will it agree felt like there, they altered yeah. in different worlds, but then when they didn't really think that much of – or that they didn't – it took them a while to realize that the other was on to them. Like, oh, no, not them. They wouldn't. I, I don't know. Yeah, the, the, when I think of those great psychological taunt between people, there was not enough interaction of that in this book. Um, which they set it up very well so that it would be that way, and then it didn't hit that. So, yeah, I, yeah, I I will agree with you there about they. The author was so good about having each of them live in their own internal world, and I loved the fact that you were getting the experience of one person and seeing like like you would Margot would watch Patricia react, and she'd be like, "Oh, she must be thinking this," and then come to find out in Patricia's perspective that maybe Margot was right maybe they maybe she wasn't like or how they both would react to different stimuli either the same or the different I just I really like that they did not actually interact enough though it was well it was written too in the fantasy of it like her characterizations in terms of I mean she she did blend all that well there weren't super plot there's one major plot hole that bothered me but there wasn't super plot holes or anything like, like the you know, when her perspective would come in, it would connect well. Mm-hmm. Like she's not a bad writer or anything. I just mm-hmm. wanted more of those two interacting. Same. And it, we had to basically get all the way to the end to have finally that interaction. So maybe that was the point. But in a lot of psychological thrillers, there's more of a buildup of that interaction. Yeah. Because even like when they had like they, they had wine or they had coffee, the tension wasn't really as tense, tense as it could be. As it could have been. Yeah. I do wish she had. Um... I wish the author had made, um, oh, what's her name? Patricia say, uh, call Margot Jane by accident, like in yeah. passing or something. Like that would have been fun. Um, but for me, the characters, I I, I liked them both. <laughs> I liked, I, I really liked how Margot was this outwardly cheery, happy person, but then she never quite understood when she wasn't hitting the mark. Mm -hmm. It was like she could pick up on it enough that people weren't giving like a laugh or they would give her a weird look or they would kind of dismiss her, but she didn't actually know what it was that she said or did. And so it created this lovely like facade that it made it easy for me to like believe that she could be super cheery and happy with all of her patrons. And then also, you know, really getting off on wanting to kill them <laughs> be with them in their dying moments yeah, yeah. how about you angelique what do you think i mean i think Margot was a little bit more fleshed out than patricia honestly for some mm-hmm. reason like um i feel like we got more of her inner thoughts in her life mm-hmm. than we did it took a while to actually like to introduce patricia yeah but i actually didn't know 
until Patricia, there was the chapter with her on it that it was going to be a back and forth. I mean, mm-hmm. I hadn't really read a lot into it. I couldn't even remember the title. For like, What are you reading? I don't know. Some of my library. And I don't know, whatever. <laughs> so, because um, I just, for some reason, that, that title wouldn't stick with me. But it took a while to actually get to Patricia's, Patricia's, I, how do you, Patricia? Patricia's. I hate this, Patricia. Sorry. Anyway, I know it's like her weird pronunciation, but it took a while to actually get to the point where she had that mark. So that's probably why you felt that. I mean, it, it, it's, it's more like, so the, so we know Margot was not, you know, quite sane. And so we could see the ending that came for her, but I don't think there was enough build up for that for Patricia, mm. honestly. Mm. I can see that because I feel like it was introduced. I just steamrolled. Sorry. Yeah, you're fine. Go ahead. I feel like it was introduced that Margot and Patricia were going to be foils. So mm-hmm. Margot's outwardly cheery, but insane. And then Patricia is cool and calm and collected, but then um, supposed to be like the, um, what is it? The guiding the moral one. Yeah. But then in reality, like what the book became was Patricia's like devolvement into almost becoming the next Margot. Yeah. And putting her own like wants and primal urges over. Uh, if you're going needs. to do that, like I've seen a lot, I've read a lot of books, I've seen a lot of movies where they kind of do the, like a great example of this is, um, it's called Three Billboards Outside Ebbing, Missouri, where it's like, one character you're you're supposed to feel sympathy for, but she does a lot of horrible things. But you still kind of feel sympathy for her. But mm-hmm. then the other character is really horrible. But then he does something great. So there's like to have more of a of a depth, and and the morals kind of cross. And like you said, it's almost like they just she just became her. Mm-hmm. And and I don't know. I, I agree with you. It didn't quite like there, there wasn't were... enough to get there. I feel like there might have been hints of it, but she didn't flesh it out enough for it to stick for me so the debate i'm having is part of the reason why i like this book is it's kind of subtle it's these everyday people have these really deep internal worlds Mm -hmm. and i really appreciate that because then it makes it relatable to the everyday person it makes it a little more creepy because your local librarian might be trying to kill you you know Mm -hmm. details Mm -hmm. um (laughs) Um, but then it, I kind of agree that it was just Patricia was too subtle. I would have really enjoyed the opportunity for Jane to feel like she's going to get found out. But then Patricia being like, actually, no, you're good. Like more opportunities for Patricia to cover up for Margot's bad behavior. Yeah. I think would have been better. To, to really intertwine, to intertwine in, them in more. more. Yeah, yeah, I agree with that. Um, yep, yep, yep. All right, next question. How important do you think the setting of the public library was to the story? Do you think it could have played out the same way in another setting? Hmm. Kind of, but I think the failed writer who becomes a librarian, I think the um, Friday guy, I think some of those quirks and some of those things are unique yeah. to that public library setting. So I think the overall similar story probably could have taken place in any workplace. But again, that was the part I, I really liked was the setting mm-hmm. and those quirky characters. And because it felt like working here every day, you know, minus the murder, um, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> minus that part. Um, but uh, <laughs> um, yeah, so so it, it could have been, but I think it was she did a really good job of making it feel like this is the place it needed to be set. That Mm -hmm. makes sense. I agree with that. And I think it adds to the fact that we are as librarians and people who work in the library are so focused on service and being service oriented and to the public. And these are two deeply selfish people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And Mm -hmm. so I, I, even one of the things I love, like very quickly, like the how can I help you becomes a very quick, like I can see Margot like just leaning in and it's like, how can I help you? But really it's how can I help myself? Right. Because she's not in service to the patrons. And with, and with Patricia, it's, it's, she, this is a stopgap. Yeah. You know, yes. she's too important to be answering questions about. It's you know, her. what's on television yeah. tonight. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. I died in the beginning when they were talking about all the different reference questions. And she's like, when am I going to get reference questions? <laughs> right, and I was right. like, we get questions about 
weather across the pond. Oh, yeah, yeah. And yeah. <laughs> like it, all of those questions, I was like, oh, no, I've definitely answered those questions before. Yeah. She wants like the questions that Dr. Al yeah, Love yeah, Dr. Yeah. Al, you know, in, in Reference 101, whatever, yeah. and, you know, find it in the British author's resource or whatever. It's yeah. like, yeah, you're not going to get those questions. <laughs> you're not, you're not going to help someone assemble a bibliography. For right, like, right. They want to know if they should get the flu shot. <laughs> yeah. They yeah. want to know if you can do their taxes. Right, right. That's legitimately okay. what yeah. Servant, like, the yeah. is provided. So I, I but we know. I, I did appreciate that characterization because I'm sure Laura Sims... We've all worked with that mm-hmm. that librarian yes. <laughs> at some yeah. point in time. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Um, what did you like most about the book? What did you like least about the book? So again, I I I think she's a good writer. I mean, there, there's nothing the good descriptions like you said. There, she does a good job of inner. As much as I say they, the characters did intertwine, but she intertwined the stories, mm-hmm. you know, and and the scenery well. Um, I just felt like it didn't hit hard enough for being this supposedly dark comedy. So I don't read mm-hmm. a lot, but I, so I always go to film. But I love dark comedy films. I love yeah. like Martin McDonough and some of the Todd Haynes and Emerald Fennel films. And those have moments where you go, ooh, you know? <laughs> <laughs> You're like, good God, I can't believe that's happening. No offense, but for some reason I never felt that here. It wasn't dark enough. It wasn't funny enough. It wasn't savage enough. So I had this expectation of that based on, again, a film, but film book, they're, they're intertwined television series of what I come to expect from these kind of, you know, screwed up, you know, dark comedy thriller type things. And, and it just, it just didn't hit for me the way that I, I kind of hoped it would. Yeah. This is not a dark comedy to me either. No. Mm-hmm. I agree. And that's why mischaracterization. Mm-hmm. Maybe that's what mm-hmm. I was looking for earlier when I was trying to say. I think, I don't think that was, it was just not, that was not it. But Did that's you what have... you put on the front. I know, but that's not necessarily the author doing that. It's true, probably true. probably the publishing company. I know, but, but, but still, that's, that's, well, even, I mean, even in the description, I mean, again, she probably didn't do that. Well, I did read an interview where someone asked her about it being darkly humorous. I didn't. Ooh, actually, what did she say? I don't remember. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> so she did intend it to be darkly humorous. Okay, well, I feel like that was probably a little and, bit of a miss. And there were like a like a moment or two where I was like, yeah, that's kind of funny. Like her animosity towards Liz, her coworker. Yes. And then there's that part where she's coming home from the hardware store with the um, shovel. shovel. <laughs> yeah. yeah, just walks right back. That's yeah. probably the closest yeah. to what I expect. Like, and then she's just kind of standing there with her shovel like, oh crap, what am I going to do with this? <laughs> That's probably the closest to what I expected. But that was one scene in a 237 page book Yeah, that I felt like hit. And so. So what I thought she did well was I thought she created these characters that created this tension because they're like trying to guess what the other one may or may not be doing. Like Margot wants to know what Patricia is writing in her book mm-hmm. and Patricia wants to know about all the murders that Margot committed. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and I get that. Cool. 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 But it was, I appreciate that it was less than 300 pages because of how much it was like building, trying to build on that like internal, not really interacting. There wasn't a, there wasn't a whole lot of plot. No. No, that's true. Not really. And unlike books where we have, so like the house in the truly and sea didn't have a whole lot of plot, but had excellent characters mm-hmm. and they interacted and so much opportunities mm-hmm. for humor. And um, I wish, I do wish they had interacted more. And maybe even over a longer period of time, because Patricia figured it out and started asking questions pretty quickly. Right, like, she'd I mean, only like, been what, there a couple weeks. weeks. Yeah, yeah. And it's like, uh, two, you know. Oh, she's a murderer. <laughs> I, I also briefly thought maybe that the detective was going to suspect Patricia because all of a sudden Patricia arrives and there are two murders. Yeah, there are two dead bodies. Okay, that was the one. The detective. I mean, they sort of mentioned him at the end, uh-huh. but you never really knew. Yeah. I, I wish we could have had a follow up with like. Did he suspect that this was that nurse that was a future? Like, mm-hmm. did he suspect Patricia? He didn't. Yes. I felt like I felt like he actually could have added an interesting twist to that. And at the end, it's like, oh, we're going to tease him again. But then I was like, well, well, we don't really know what he was. He could have just been like, okay, they were both there. I have to interview them. And then he put his notebook down because he couldn't figure it out. <laughs> so we don't know. And I felt like that was an interesting thing to introduce. And then it kind of. They kind of. Yeah. I agree with that. He could have been a great mm-hmm. device. 
in, um, you know, causing the tension between uh, whether the characters are pitted against each other and or helping each other. Mm -hmm. I agree. So a divider kind of like like if they had gotten closer, Mm -hmm. which they never did. Then, yeah. then the then that introduction of that could have been something that would have started more tension, like some of that psychological tension to really rev up. What do you think over there? So when he was first introduced, I was thinking that he wasn't actually a police detective. He was like uh, faking being an imposter. What? And but he was actually maybe like a family member of a previous victim Ooh. of uh, Jargos. That would have been cool. Yeah, hmm? that would have been cool. Yeah, and then there would have been and so he would have been another antagonist for both of them. Mm-hmm. To maybe be against, mm-hmm. and then they would eventually go against each other to save themselves, kind of thing. That would have been good too. Yeah, and it kind of happened, but it didn't like because Patricia lied to him about um, Margo. seeing Margot yeah, with yeah, the yeah. shovel. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but but Margot didn't know that Patricia lied for her. Yeah, right. So yeah. So again, it was it, it could have been something. Yeah, it was they just, could have intertwined them more. Made that was them, the plot hole that bothered made them me. a little bit more codependent on each other. Kind oh, of okay, thing. I was wondering what the plot well, hole was. It for wasn't you. really a plot hole. It wasn't really a plot hole. But yeah, it was like a, a gap. It, just just something that. Okay, well, but what about that? Mm-hmm. So um, you asked for things I liked and didn't mm-hmm. like. Yes, I, I there were a couple scenes that I, I have quotes, but then there were also I mean a couple scenes I kind of liked that. Margot was so efficient at getting patrons to do what she wanted. Yeah. <laughs> you know? She whispered in that ear. It's like, bam. Like the guy, yeah, the, the gentleman that kept going in the loop. And she was like, oh, actually, um, Patrice is actually the one who is going to do the ex- oh, I can't funny. remember yeah. what he was concerned about. What was he concerned uh, about? Um, email like viruses. Hacking. Oh, viruses. Yes. Yeah, She's yeah. the one controlling the email viruses. And if you go to her, <laughs> she'll send you more. So, like, I'm like, that was that was just funny and clever. <laughs> like, and even like the first couple little fri- – like the one – maybe the first Friday guy thing where mm-hmm. she kind of got a little dark. Yeah. And then, of course, that went <laughs> – Not the one later. Not the but... one later, but the first one was kind of like, okay, mm-hmm. you probably shouldn't have said that. But you know what? Sometimes you have to get to their level. You have to get real clear. <laughs> yeah, get real clear and get to their level. And it freaked them out and he left. So maybe it worked. Yeah. But then I thought it was interesting that they the author revealed later – you know, Margot revealed later that she, they actually liked that cat and mouse play where they both needed that exchange. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. I agree. What are your quotes again? <laughs> um, People can live off bitterness for years on page mm-hmm. 34 in That's reference true. to the eccentric patron with mm. the, the old money that kind of ran out. The one who first died? Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Julia, who Julia died in the right. bathroom. And then um, Julia, she would take uh, she takes her nails through the air to include all of us, the layabouts who profit from her bounteous wealth. And it makes me think of all the people who come in and are like, I pay your salaries. You need to do what I want. Right. And it's like, thank you for your. <laughs> I also pay my salary. <laughs> I know. Right, right. Contributing this bounteous wealth. Um, thank you for your $18.36. <laughs> mm-hmm. I wake with a headache wondering if reading is more dangerous than I thought. And oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And it's a troubling day at work, possibly because of the book. I feel detached from the real world and disappointed by the real world. And I felt that because when you are when you have a book that gets in you mm-hmm. under your skin, in your brain, and you just don't stop thinking about it. Yeah, it interrupts the real life. Yeah. True story. So those are my, my quotes that I liked. My friend used to say, true fact. I was like, That's a, that is redundant. But anyway, <laughs> true fact. <laughs> Um, okay, so there was one thing that took me a while to get used to in the book. I don't know that I disliked it towards the end, but so the way that Sims did dialogue, she would have it all in the paragraph together. She wouldn't separate different speakers out. Yes. Oh. And it kind of drove me crazy at I first. That. But then I realized that she was doing it as to like create like a little scene mm-hmm. within a scene, like a little vignette, I guess. And it started making sense then, but it still, it's, it frustrated me so much at the beginning. I'm like, separate them out. Start a new line. <laughs> there were a couple times where I wasn't sure who the speaker, like, who was yeah. speaking. So I get, yes, I see. I didn't, I didn't, uh, until you said it, I didn't realize it. So. <laughs> I, I love how different, mm-hmm. like, that, and, and to, uh, I'd have to go back, and, like, I now want to go back and look, look at it and at see it, because I just never noticed it, but it's interesting how different readers will see different things. That's cool. I, I also love it. that you described it as vignettes, because I feel like the stories that happen in our day are just a bunch of vignettes. Yeah. yeah. Like, our day is just... 
patron patron you know we have like hour blocks on the mm-hmm. desk so mm-hmm. it's like this hour block and then i get a break so then this hour block and what happened each patron interaction can be a little mm-hmm. play yeah and even if each space could be its own little vignette as well yeah. like last night when maddie was saying that she had a weird hour on the desk and then you took over and it was completely fine yeah, <laughs> <laughs> Poor yeah. Maddie. yeah it was very quiet wow. for my last two hours um good good <laughs> <Last. laughs> what do you think of the ending it happened too fast. It was like all of this buildup and then like 15 pages is where it all. Yeah. And it was it made it harder to digest the quote unquote twist that Patricia, you know, killed Margot. Mm-hmm. Like I needed a little bit more follow up after that. Also, they, they mentioned, I think twice that Margot had burned down her family home or they mm-hmm. mentioned like mm-hmm. something of it. Mm hmm. And oh, so it's and like she died in a fire. And she died yeah. in a fire. Like yeah. so she, or she was going to start the that was yeah. going to be her that's her how she refreshes things. Yeah. It, it, mm. she she runs away from them but in her see, like it more. see the, the the burn on the Yeah. Yeah, yeah. you know. Oh. But to be fair, it was like it was a one-off thing and it was like okay, so she's been sociopathic since she was a child. It didn't feel like it was going to be important. And I know that sometimes that's the that's the whole point of the mystery. It's the little thing you didn't think of. Yeah. But again, it, it, they said it as kind of like a character building thing, and then it became such a huge part of it. Um, and I know how that sounds. That's foreshadowing, and sometimes it works and sometimes it didn't. But to me, it didn't quite. As, as soon as they, oh, she's going to burn the thing down. Like, it, I don't know. It, it Anyway, it just didn't work for me. So there was one I thing. Don't have to say it. There was one thing that sort of felt like a plot hole to me, but maybe wasn't for like like you said, Detective Parson was a plot hole for yes. you. So they kept so a few once or twice for Patricia, they mentioned an incident for with her writing and oh, why yeah. she stopped, but they never she never really hinted at anything more about it. Other than that it was just a rejection. Yeah. And she was like depressed lying on the floor and her boyfriend had to like force her to get up or something like that. There were a few few Chekhov's guns that yeah yeah never fired yes and it felt like that she could have used that to explain how she became a murderer yeah how easily she was able to to she how unhesitant she was to kill Margot, basically yeah because, because technically it was related to her writing right I mean, because she was trying to burn yeah. her she obviously got obsessed with Margot, mm-hmm. right so mm-hmm. maybe she got obsessed with someone else Ooh. When she was writing her other book, her first book. And then it turns out her great manifesto was just a bunch of crazy ramblings. That yeah. would have been a juicy little detail. Yeah. And just enough. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That it would have. It would have linked them more. Because then what happens is she kills her, but then she's like, oh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let it burn. And then she's like, basically saying what Margot said, I'm going to help them rebuild. And, and I'm like, so then she just becomes Margot's story. Yeah. I part I, I that that part I got it and I liked that it was like okay now Patricia is taking up this new mantle and perhaps it will drive her in the future to make a more drastic yeah thing but I just in the name of her writing like to become obsessive and stalk somebody else I thought it was kind of impressive how well they knew each other for not knowing each other like that sometimes I was like oh they would have the exact same thought about the <laughs> same thing caught me a little off guard yeah and it would explain why dan was so against her writing her boyfriend mm. it would explain why he was so against mm. her writing yeah because they kind of just made him be out be just crusher of dreams yeah i know he was the antagonist but there was nothing actually other than the fact that he was kind of boring yeah there, like he just wanted to stay at home all the time i'm like that's my dream <laughs> <laughs> I did that all day. It was lovely. <laughs> I'm like, Dan just made a whole bunch of money at whatever he does that's boring, and then he took you out to dinner, and then you stayed home. Was cool. He... Yeah. yeah. A nice car. like well, yeah. Yes, absolutely. Living in Chicago. Hi, Dan. I know. Nice high-rise apartment. With great hair. Come yeah. on, Dan. Hello. Yeah. You're right. I think that <laughs> I think that, that would, though, have helped her transformation as well. I Yes. Because maybe job. that's why when you said you, you saw it, but I just, I didn't, that would have helped. There, there was there was that little edge missing, I think. Yeah. So we've rewritten it for you, and we've decided once that again <laughs> we've rewritten. I feel like that's really just what the crux of our podcast yes. is: is how to make the book better. Yes. And unless unless we really like it, and then we, then we don't. We're not too bad about it. But. No, no, yeah, yeah. Well, we should make we should rename the podcast. We make it up. <laughs> <laughs> that is okay. kind of just true about everything <laughs> across the board. <laughs> okay, um, so we sort of answered this. As library employees, do you think the library was accurately portrayed? 
Yes. They called it the Cirque Desk. And, and I was uh, like, that's just like a little thing that, I don't know, they, she had the library language in there. Yeah, but there were a few things that like made me focus more on like the library itself than the actual story. Mm-hmm. And so I wrote them down, a little question <laughs> yeah, to add. Yeah, no, I'm good. Let's do it. Okay. So I know it's a small like municipal library, mm-hmm. but like, are there really only five employees in the entire building? They talked about having floors, and I don't yeah. understand that because if the circ desk is on the same floor as the reference desk, yeah, but then like and then the... the rare books are in the basement or whatever downstairs. I just don't. I guess I don't understand the, was, the layout of the was building. that the room where they took the women? Yeah, to the the fire happened was downstairs. Yeah, but is that there? There's a there's a plot about. Yeah, that's probably where she took the lady but then, downstairs. The, but there, she took a lady downstairs. But there's one where like these two women come in and they're researching local history. Yeah, I think maybe is, is that the same room? But then yeah, I don't remember I don't them know. saying it went know. downstairs. So it made me feel like that was a whole different like on the yeah. same floor. So it's not unlikely. Like I said, it's a small municipal library. So maybe there is only five employees. But can really three of them just leave to go get coffee, <laughs> and leave one to be interrogated and the reference library, the new. <laughs> reference librarian without I don't even think they told Patricia that they were leaving. I, I just know, assumed there were more <laughs> Okay, so if we were okay, let's think about it. If we were in, let's say we were in Lowell, then mm-hmm. yes, there would be five. I think it was more just like I was I was more shocked by the fact that there was a position that had been vacant for twelve years and that yeah. they were finally able to yeah. fill it as yeah. a reference specific librarian. I don't know. We've been waiting on, okay. on some for a couple of years now. I okay. can't believe Okay, there's more. There's more. Is there no youth services? I know there's young adult books because you mentioned it at one point. Is there no youth services? Is there no programming? That makes me feel like that this is just in Cirque and Reference and that there's other parts of the library. I don't know. Because 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 Yvonne was the – her boss was the director of the library. That is true, but you could still have a children's section that would be not pertinent. But then, to the like book. when the the body happened, it's like they're still with the same employee. They, there's also, no mention of like that's true. We're yeah. standing outside, and oh, the children's librarian's like, what happened in the basement? She like, really could have just yeah. like thrown yeah, like a yeah. children's librarian, like keeping the kids like also the in story time or something. The making them work after that, after like. I feel like they should have shut down the library. We Quite would frankly, have. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. If nothing else, there's going to be an investigation. Yeah. Your bathrooms are closed. And then right. just like as out of respect of for a patron, a patron that died passing on the away yeah. Yes. Yes. in the library. Also, are they not open on the weekends? Yeah, I get the sense they're not, and I hate them. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe they don't have the funding for it. Maybe. Maybe, but still. <laughs> yeah, no, I know. I Make agree. it work. <laughs> Make it I, work. I agree. It should like that is weird. Okay. What was it? Make it up. Make it up. <laughs> <laughs> so those are the little things that we would have put into the book. Yes, help. It, it does make me space. think that she really did. She wanted to hyper focus. Yeah, she on like, these two like across from each yeah. other. Yeah, especially since she was a reference librarian. Maybe that's just not what she was thinking about at all. Tunnel vision, yeah. I think. Yeah. yeah. And also, I like that part of that interview I read that said that she didn't really focus on setting too much. So that was probably part of it oh, as well. Oh, was that part of why you asked your question about what did you think the setting mattered? Yeah, of course. Oh. I mean, I do well, think. Because also think revealing things at the end. So for me, I had a vision of Laura Sims sitting at her part-time reference desk writing this book. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> she did She did write. She does write at her reference job, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, all right. Last question. If the book were adapted to screen, who would play the main characters? Cool. So I went Lifetime Movie mm-hmm. because I felt like this would be the best way to adapt it, which means it's a little extra. I feel like Margot should be Melissa McCarthy. <laughs> Not like, okay, so. If she were funnier, I would, have, I would go with that. Hear me out. Melissa McCarthy reining it in and making it super tight. Did you ever see Can, I, Can You Ever Forgive Me with her about the writer yeah, who steals other right. writing? Mm-mm. Okay, now I could see it because she plays this very somber, obsessive writer who ends up like rewriting classical works and selling them as fakes. Uh So, yeah, I'm I'm in. You also have to remember she's well liked. She's Jolly Jane. And so she's boisterous and doesn't like like Melissa McCarthy. I can see it like doing a a beat where it's um, 
happy, exciting. She thinks everything's going, everyone's loving her, and then suddenly she loses the beat. She she misses the point, and it's like Melissa like Melissa could recover from that so beautifully. So well, if yeah. you think about some of her characters, like uh, in Bridesmaids, she missed the point. Like yeah. she was in her own little world. So yeah, you're right. No, I, I, she's a much more versatile. People give her. She's an incredibly versatile actress. So, so yeah, make like that, that the physical comedy. Plus, she was Ursula. She can do dark. And I feel like she maybe could fill in some of those where I feel like there isn't enough comedy gaps. Yeah. Because sometimes she's really good just about like, she's so great on SNL, like with the mannerisms and just like her looks and her like little offbeat things. And so I feel like that would work. What? I just kept envisioning her with like a bun on top of her head and glasses askew, like on top of a dead body trying to like get up and like falling and like being wedged in there. I just, I see that, it. That would work. Yeah. Way. Yeah. She'd be doing I could imagine her, them doing like a set piece where she's trying to get the body in and she mm. misses like four or five times. <laughs> and she's just like, God bless it. Da, 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 da. So we've just turned this into a straight comedy. That's where we've gone with this. Well, maybe that's what it needs to do. Yeah. If it were re- full on dark comedy. Yeah. Like, if it were a big screen a Olivia Coleman would be my choice. If it were like a legit, if we like really David Fincher did, yeah, I would do she'd a legit. Well, but I mean, Melissa McCarthy's an Oscar now. I mean, she, she, both yeah. of those would are, yeah, because Olivia Coleman is very funny. She, she is. So She's funny. so funny. But then did you, did you watch, you probably didn't, it wasn't, eh, The Secret Invasion with um, Sam Jackson, Samuel L. Jackson? Mm-mm. Olivia Coleman's in that and her character is the best thing about it because really? she plays this like, agent who's just not afraid to torture like <laughs> well she um i mean in the favorite you know she has these two women like vying for her power or whatever mm-hmm. and she it's it's a very darkly funny so she's she has kind of you know she's played those kind of roles she's before like yeah a... see i went with there's a new movie called may december which is kind of todd haynes take on a lifetime movie <laughs> and it's natalie portman and um Julianne Moore. I didn't see Julianne Moore, but I saw Natalie Portman because she become and actually her character kind of does the Patricia thing where she um, sort of trying to tries to become Julianne Moore's really screwed mm-hmm. up character. Oh. So in my mind, I thought of for Patricia, I thought of Natalie Portman just because I literally had just seen that movie a couple makes, weeks ago. Makes me think about Black Swan and Mila Kunis now. <laughs> oh, Mila Kunis would be good with that. Mm-hmm. All right, I have, I have. Oh, yes, got, yes, yes, yes. <gasps> okay, sorry. I got uh, either, Sh- I don't know why, Charlize Theron or Laura Dern for Margot. <gasps> Laura oh. Dern. Yeah, I think Laura Dern would be good. And then, I've never actually seen her act, but when I thought of Patricia, she came to my head. Camilla Mendez, she was in Riverdale as Veronica. Oh, okay, okay. She's she's young, she's... Yeah. So, I guess I probably, I couldn't... <sighs> Patrice is hard because I had a clear vision of her in my brain and I cannot find an actress that fits that because it needs to be a young person. So I was like, oh, like a Jenna Ortega, someone who's kind of quiet, who could do quiet, but like still rich in her life. Mm -hmm. But then also she was a failed writer. So even though she had just graduated with her master's and a failed, I feel like she needs to be at least mid to late 20s. Maybe mm-hmm. early thirties. So not as young as you think. I think it not because I think there needs to be a lot of. I think there's needs to be more like underlying failure and like. Camilla, she is like twenty nine. Okay, so she probably let's Google her. All right, like I said, she was in Riverdale. Mm-hmm. Tell me again. Same. I Camilla pictured what? Camilla Mendez, M E N D E S. I pictured Jean Carla Esposito <laughs> for the detective. Is that not perfect? And I don't know why because he can do kind of warm. And he's but handsome. He, he's very handsome. A thousand percent, yes. This is the girl. Oh, yeah. That's that would be Patricia. perfect. Yeah, yeah, I like she's that. She's perfect. I like Laura Dern. Good for, that's a good choice. Thank you. She does a lot of... She she can do that. She's yeah. like the right age, too. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But I like Melissa McCarthy, too. I, mean, I would have to see how Camilla and Melissa actually interact, and Camilla and Laura, Laura Dern. Yeah, or even Olivia, yeah. Or Olivia, yeah. all how they interact with each other. Yeah. You know, um, the Nazrin, is that how you say her yeah, name? Yeah, I think so. Nazrin. Or Naz- Nazrin or Nazrin, yeah, I wasn't yeah, sure. Yeah. Um, so this one's a little off because I know she uh, wears the hijab, so she's probably not Indian. But I kept seeing um, the actress from Glow. Um, I know who you're talking about, yes. And she's like a tiny, feisty teenager yeah. who just plays innocent and funny and quirky so beautifully. Um Sunni in Yvonne, I think they described as black, as African American. Yes. Mm. 
Viola Davis. Yes. Someone Octavia talk. Spencer. Yes. Mm, ooh, better. Yeah. Octavia Spencer and Melissa McCarthy are best friends. They are. <gasps> <gasps> do this movie. That would be perfect. <laughs> would you watch this movie then? Yes. <laughs> okay. Well, you had to meet Melissa McCarthy. We got, we got to figure out who's going to be Liz, though. Sunita Mani is who Let me see that picture. And she picture. was in Everywhere, all, uh, Everything Everywhere All at Once. Um, oh. Her. Ah, yes. Yes, yeah. yes, yes. Yeah. Perfect. Side note, Glow is a good show. It was a good show, yeah. I yeah. hate that they didn't finish like, it. Um, Alison like, Brie. Yeah, she'd be good at that. Yeah. So Liz. Liz is a be, Yenta. Yeah, we'd have to find someone who who would be understandable for Margaret to dislike just instantly on site. <laughs> hmm. Who do I instantly dislike on site as an actor? <laughs> That one I didn't picture because Liz wasn't really. They didn't do enough with her, other than she was just kind of eh. So we'll, we'll, maybe we'll say <laughs> a a actress that can play annoying or like overbearing, overbearing, know yes. it all. And this is kind of random, but the the redheaded lady from um, that played the aunt, in, no, Melissa McCarthy's mom, um, in um, red hair, Mike and Molly. Swoozie Kurtz. Mm-hmm. I like Swoozie Kurtz. She and she's in, funny. She was in Pushing Daisies, too. That's what I was thinking of. But yeah. Yeah, okay. That'd be, that would work. Like, it's not who I'm picturing, but in this moment while we're talking about it, I feel like she could be done. But it, I don't know. It's someone who's going to have like her degree, so she went about it the right way, yeah. and she kind of lords it over everyone yeah. else. Mm. That's the someone we need that energy to Felicity come to the Huffman. <laughs> yeah. Well, she didn't do things the right way. No. No, but she can play the person who does. And at this Fair. point, a lifetime is probably what she could get. So if we're going that direction, it might you work. Know? You know? She's actually a very good actress. She <laughs> she's is. not a great yeah, person, but she's a really good actress. Oh, gosh. All right. What's next? Well, that was the last question. Oh, okay. Do we have any final thoughts about the book that we didn't manage to get across? I think a lot of people would like this better than I liked it. Like, I think a lot more people are going to feel the way you feel about it. I think it. that people who love true crime would like this yes. book. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So if you like true crime, read this book. Which I don't either. So, I mean, that's my problem. It's like, a, And the pacing's really good, so you get through it quick. It's so fast. It's I'm about to say, it is a very, it, yeah, I mean, I plowed through 200 pages today, <laughs> and it kept my interest. Like, it, it wasn't ever uninteresting. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so, so yeah, if you're looking for a quick read, and if you love libraries, if you love things set in libraries, and you love being here as you read this, especially for, I mean, I'm here way too often, but um, <laughs> <laughs> but I did feel it. Yeah. And, and yeah. so um, we have a lot of people who are patrons who love being in this building yeah. and love being in libraries. So I think that they would like that setting a lot. And if you like this book, you'll probably like We Have Always Lived in the Castle, I think. Mm. Yeah, I want to read it now, especially now that you liked it. I did. I did like it. So if you like Shirley Jackson novels. Ooh, yeah. 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 All right. Do you want to go over any notes? Oh, no, I already did. Oh, um, that's right. I read it so fast and quotes. then I was thinking. Yeah, it was mostly quotes. Just your quotes? That I uh, just, I thought Margo was really weird. Yeah. Well, yeah. that was the whole point. So. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I wrote that note at like three pages in and I was like, okay, librarians do not think this. Like, I'm <laughs> kind of like, I don't know, in the very beginning when she's like, I don't know, <laughs> aroused by like going and shushing people and stuff. And like, mm. Yeah, she's, she's she like remember she was creating a fake character, so maybe she was creating but more she's of a stereotype based on a real person. She's based on that's a real what person. we should talk about. Jolly Jane was a real uh, nurse in like the eighteen hundreds and um, early nineteen hundreds, maybe. Yeah, like the I think she was born in like eighteen. Did she became yeah. a librarian? No, uh, no. she oh. became a nurse. She became a nurse oh. and she killed like quite Thir- a few people, like thirty mm. some people, thirty one. That she claimed, or like the uh-huh. newspaper claimed, but they only know about so many. But mm-hmm. they were able to confirm so many. And she like admitted that she would get in bed with them sometimes, and she would be like, she loved the looking like at the people like dying and coming back to life and dying again because of how she was administering morphine. Mm-hmm. And did you there read was the Wikipedia a, page too? I did. <laughs> and there was a, a sexual. Yeah, I barely read the book. It. <laughs> yeah, it was it was a fetish for her. And she oh, had okay. a bun. In her she picture, had she had a bun. So that's where you got that that image, maybe. Well, that and then the book, the Margot always has a bun. She oh, talks about that. how she used to have like blonde hair and it was like long, and then she just put it up and made it dark. Yeah. I thought of one thing we didn't discuss: the baths. Oh yeah. You kept mentioning the hot baths. Oh yeah, <laughs> that was just, yes, yeah. me tease because it was just like 
anything she could do wrong. It didn't matter. She, she just was, had to go home and have a bath. She was very into rituals. Mm. Very yeah. into so it's a, like it's a smart way her to say daily it. life and how it was all scheduled out. Like Friday guy always came on Friday. Mm-hmm. Oh, and yeah, and she did. She had a bad day when Friday guy didn't yeah. show up. When things was, changed, when Patricia Patricia came, her life got unsettled because there was this new person in her life that she had to account for now. Mm-hmm. Even if it was just only at work. But I like, guess work why was she was jealous life. of like, you know how she um, was really pissed off at the priest because they got to spend those last minutes. Yeah. But then there's also yeah. that, yeah. the woman, oh, they can just say whatever they want and they're forgiven or whatever. And so maybe... That's her version of going to a priest. She created her own version of being able to just wash it away, like mm-hmm. final rites, um, so that she didn't have to live in purgatory. She made some comment about purgatory or whatever. Maybe that was someone else did, but that comment was made. Oh, there was that other thing. That guy who came in and was like, I would never use the bathroom here. Like, Oh, yeah, because he didn't want to die. Yeah, he didn't want to die in the bathroom. He just, like said it to oh. um, Margot's face. Yeah, He just came in and burped and then like, <laughs> I don't want to die. I left. I liked him. Also, Randomly. he felt real to life. <laughs> yes, yeah. Because, like, anytime there's any kind of drama scuffle and somebody comes back after they witness it, they would say something like that. Yeah. <laughs> that, was, that was funny. Yeah. I want to die in the bathroom. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Anything else? I think I'm okay now. I'm good. Yeah. All right. To close out this episode, I'm going to promote the NC Digital Library from Overdrive. Through the NC Digital Library, you have access to ebooks, including Kindle books, and downloadable audiobooks that you can access through a desktop browser on your mobile device through the Libby app. Look for the link to the NC Digital Library at gastonlibrary.org. I will also put it in the episode description. That's it for this episode of We're Booked Up. How Can I Help You by Laura Sims is available at the library. Let us know what you think of the book and what you think of what we think of the book. Just leave a comment at the -the off-the-shelf blog at gastonlibrary.blogspot.com or at gastonspeaks.podbean.com. Next month's book is Book Lovers by Emily Henry. Thanks for listening. Bye. Bye, guys.